Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Irene again, Irene Mawel. I am um, a facilitator with uh, Image Africa. Um, today is the 1st of November, and we are so honored to have uh, Dr. Osman Sadek uh, with us. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about a continuum. Um, a continuum of teachers' e-learning practices. Um, so, yes, as I said, it's the 1st of November, so I think uh, the new month brings us uh, quite nice things. Uh, and we welcome everybody. As, as I introduce you to, to uh, Dr. Osman Sadek, kindly type in where you're joining us from uh, in the text chat. Today we are so lucky to have um, Dr. Osman Sadek, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. <laughs> uh, uh, perfect, yes. Um, Dr. Osman is uh, currently from um, a, a post a doctoral researcher and ever a project manager at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town, in South Africa, of course, for the assessment uh, for learning in Africa project. He previously worked as the head of e-learning in the Western Cape Education Department in the Western Cape Province in South Africa, where he led the implementation of e-learning across um, across the province until his retirement in 2016. He developed the e-vision uh, for the province and introduced an LMS for e-learning along professional development strategies that include e-pedagogy uh, courses. He has previously co-authored the assessment model for uh, AUS AID BTEC, Technology Education, New Wave D D TP and uh, Repro in 1999, and a series of uh, school textbooks for technology education. He has worked in quite a number of places and influenced a lot of people. I think we cannot fit uh, some of these things because I think they're so mega uh, into this. However, I would like to give a chance to uh, Dr. Osman to start his presentation or his, his talk, uh, the webinar, on uh, the continuum of teacher e learning practices. Uh, over to you, Dr. Osman Sadek. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as mentioned, I am Dr. Osman Satek. Um, I wanted to share with you my contact details. It's not on the first slide. I will mention it now, but I've got it on the last slide. Uh, my email address is osadeck at gmail.com. This is for all of you who are going to want to chat to me after this. Um, thank you again for all of you for attending, and especially to the team for setting up and organizing this uh, webinar for us this afternoon. Um, our discussion for today is going to be a continuum of teachers' e-learning practices. Um, I've got these slides on the right-hand side of my screen. I'm assuming the same on your screen. And what I am going to do is use these slides as a basis for chatting uh, today. Um, what I want to do is um, I want to share with you aspects related to aspects of progression and depth regarding e-learning practices and how they relate to continuums and I want to then share with you some key takeaways for this session. Uh, I'm hoping to make this session as interactive as possible. And for that, I'm going to welcome your participation, questions, and some responses to questions that I have for you. Uh, during this session, uh, you're going to want to be locating yourself in the debate itself uh, through reflecting on some of the questions. Um, so to kick off, I'm going to go on to my next slide. I'm going to go on to my next slide. And on this particular slide, I've just put on three words, why, what, and how. It's important to locate this because the study, this paper came out of a doctoral study, my doctoral study, and I had asked three important questions. Why? 
what and how regarding teachers' e-learning practices. Uh, what was uh, the what and the how questions are what I'm going to concentrate on in this particular presentation, speaking specifically about um, the way in which I found during the study with the sample of teachers, what they were doing with the technologies and how they were doing how they were doing this in the classroom. The why itself was interesting because that was uh, one of the key takeaways that I will be sharing with you, <clears throat> where I had used a whole lot of term iterations, the theory of reasoned actions, the theory of planned behavior, the concern-based adoption model, and social cognitive theories to get a sense of why people use technology in any case. But for our purposes in this session over here, I'm going to concentrate on the what and how. So let's start off with a very important key takeaway, which sometimes comes up at the end of the session, but I wanted to give it to you right up front. And the first one, the first bullet, where I say that people choose and use technology. And the why question that was answered there was on account of benefits that they feel they would get from it and the type of value propositions that any of these technologies afforded them, both in their personal lives as well as their professional lives. The second bullet, the second key takeaway for me, and possibly the most important one, is the levels of use of ICT, the integration and development should, should be viewed as non-sequential. It's important because as we go through this presentation, I try to argue that it is not a step that goes from one to the next to the next. But more importantly, I wanted to point out that these are not points of attainment, They're not something that you get there and you say, I'm done and dusted. But these are indications of points of growth. For this, you will find that I have, uh, I'm going to be showing you two patterns. And these patterns are progression in complexity. That's when people start using from the very basic uses to advanced uses. And then a progression of depth. And this here is about at any one of these points that there is developmental levels that people can be going deeper in as well. So to kick off, I want to situate the debate, and I want to go, I'm going to use the very common things that are said about uh, the use of ICTs in education. And these are the three that I'm uh, saying are being claimed, that people don't use technologies, that it is underused. They also claim that the technologies are not used the way it is expected. This is that it's expected by somebody that you use it a particular way. And the third one is a criticism of all of us in the ICT space that the use, the way in which we use technologies is traditional, very traditional. So my first question to get you on the go is, I need to know from you, so is this a problem? So I would welcome you quickly typing onto your uh, keyboards there whether you think this is a problem or not or any other uh, comments that you might have. And I will be uh, watching this as it come on. We'll give a few seconds for that. Okay, I see some, there is a, a comment that says that people are underusing technology. And I like the one here that says that it's whatever works for them. And we have an interesting one here about misuse and abuse as well.
Mm -hmm. Okay, we're getting a sense that that that, that people uh, are not necessarily saying that they find this a problem, but they're also getting a sense that different people use it differently. Uh, and the one that comes in now, uh, the people use it for the sake of it and not for its purpose. And that's also useful because when we look later on as to uh, what people are using technology for, we find the aspects of innovation and basic use and traditional use. Um, so you can continue sending in your comments to that first question. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of input about the second part of the one and, and to share with you why does it look this way. In other words, why does it look that people are saying that we don't use it? Now, one of the, the important things that uh, I have been able to pick up is that the use of technologies are influenced by policies. In most cases. Now, this policies might be high up governmental policies or it might be a policy at a particular school. And there is a tendency for people to use an if then approach. They and they would say, uh, if we give you this technology, then you will use it. And if you use it, then all will be well. Learning will happen and or all things will work out the way it's supposed to be. Now, this becomes a bit of a problem for us because a lot of our provisioning of technologies or programs have a political uh, influence in it. And so politicians generally, or governments, uh, one might put it that way as well, uh, generally tend to want to see something happening and they say, well, I will supply these things and so you need to do it. And so we find that these things start becoming uh, part of the debate as to whether we use the technology or underuse it, whether we use it the way they expect it to be used, that they've read in a book, if you do this, this will happen. And of course, they say, but you're just using it in a very traditional way. But if I go on to, and I'm moving on to the next slide now, is to actually try to locate ourselves. And here is your chance now to think about something. I know in my case, I have to think back a fairly long time, but maybe some of you as well. So the question for you is now, what was your first technology device? After you figured out or remembered what it is, then I needed to ask yourself, what did you use it for? And after that, what did you use it for? And after that, what did you use it for? So let's have a get uh, a little bit of input from your side in terms of uh, your technology device and what you've been using it for and then changing uses. Also interesting is the comment about uh, a definition of uh, traditional use where some people believe that using a PowerPoint for lecturing or just sharing something on an LMS is considered uh, traditional. Ah, we see the first device was a laptop. I remember the Nokia's as well. Mm -hmm. The DOS ones. Uh, the question over here is first technology you owned or it could be shared. I would say the one that you owned first. We're getting a sense of the type of uh, devices that we've had and I see it. A lot of them were the what we call the big, big computers. 
Uh, there was a laptop and we've got uh, well, mobile phones or cell phones. Uh, can you give me a sense of uh, what you started using it for? Okay, so the computer was used for word processing, mm -hmm. and there was uh, a mention of uh, playing games, yeah, playing games on a computer, a phone that was used for communicating. Gabriel, would uh, I would think that that would be to call people, as in a phone call, chat, oh yeah, mix it, I see, yeah, we've got to mix it. Okay, I'm going to start uh, talking, uh, chatting into this now as well. And uh, I, uh, as I've picked up some of the things that you've done and uh, you've owned, and you will find that we tended to have in, in, in no particular order, but cell phones and mobile phones, uh, PCs, the actual computer, the very big ones, laptops. I'm not sure if I heard anybody mention a tablet, but what we would find is that we ourselves have had different types of technologies over a period of time. So on the particular, and I re, oh, and I see here yeah, Tamagotchi, I remember mine eventually died. Um, then I wanted to actually share with you, so what prompts are we use? Uh, remembering our key takeaways, I, I spoke about that there is a continuum of use and, and uh, practice. So in terms of the use over here, I said, that use is based on needs and opportunities. In other words, we would have used any one of our own technologies or that which was given to us or shared with us based on needs and opportunities that we have. But I wanted to then now add to you what are some of the aspects that these are influenced by. Now, one of the things in terms of using was self-efficacy. It is influenced by our abilities to actually use it. A second aspect, and these are almost like bullet points, the second one is policy. Now, policy here, I'm referring to what happens in a school situation and possibly at university as well, where it is forced upon you to use the technology. Whether it's HOD, head of department, deans, they said, now that we have this technology, you have to do it. And so people start using it because they have to use it. Then there is the additional one of beliefs, where you have policy beliefs, and these are beliefs that are about first and second order outcomes. These sec first and sec second order outcomes are if I do this, then something else will happen. So if I, if I use the example, if I put something onto the LMS, then the students might be, will have access to the notes, and if they have access to the notes, there is a chance that they will read it and perhaps study for it. So we believe that this technology can be useful to us. The next one is affordances. We believe that certain technologies can do things for us, and because we believe this, then we will actually use So if we feel that the uh, phone and using WhatsApp on the phone is going to get our message to us, then we are going to say, yes, I'm going to use a, a mobile phone and I'm going to. The third, the last one that I want to add over here in terms of influence is the external influences. And this is that we may have seen someone using a technology and when we did this and we felt, whoa, I'd like to do that or this looks good, it looks easy or I'd like to have the same result, then we start. It's a type of vicarious learning where we learn by watching somebody and believe, okay, uh, I would like to do that. So in that continuum of use that I've actually got at the bottom of that slide over there, where I've got personal administration, teaching and learning, this here is actually drawn out of the data in the study itself, where we found that people in the sample, and it is, there's a chance that this could be many of us, 
that we start using technology for personal purposes first. So if you cast your mind back to how you located yourself, we first used it for ourselves. In our professional work, then we started using it for administration. In most cases, it would have been, okay, I need to type out letters, I need to do a bit of word processing, I need to collect marks and things of that sort. Then we find that there was a movement of teachers moving towards using it for teaching. Now, here was uh, one of those examples was actually put on when they spoke about we used uh, a PowerPoint presentation was used for the actual lesson itself. Then we found that teachers were starting to use it for with their learners or with their students. Now, the important thing in this particular case is that we were not able to find any backward tracking. In other words, when we found that a person or a teacher was using it for learning in the class, that person would have already gone through using it for personal administration and teaching. It wasn't, we didn't find somebody suddenly using it for learning, but not having used it for administration per purposes first. The other important aspect in terms of the continuum of use is how we started actually using it. In many of the cases, we would have been learning on our own. We probably tried something out. We had somebody tell us uh, about it. Then we found that as we went to the, into administration and teaching, we would go to a more structured course or a little workshop to actually find out how to use this, so whether it was Excel or how to create a PowerPoint. So we started, others started helping us to learn. And then we find as we move forward in our own development, we started going into a sort of a spiral. We started experimenting again, trying things out for ourselves. And so from the initial trying to learn on our own, then learning with others becomes a spiral of we're constantly learning from others and then at the same time, we are spiraling back into um, doing some uh, work with, uh, with ourselves by experimenting. Uh, thank you. I think it's actually going well so far. Are there any comments that anybody wants to make before I start with the practice aspect of the presentation? I think we can move forward. Uh, they'll be typing in the text and you'll be reading when there are comments. I think we'll proceed, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'm actually picking that up. Uh, okay, then the next one that I want to actually go into is the e-learning practice. Now, e-learning practice is the way in which people actually do things. The reason for using the word e-learning practice and not just talking about practice, in here we were speaking specifically about the use of ICTs. And for us, it's important that it's the that the practice is based on what people know, what they do, and then what they believe. This year, I would say, is an important thing because what happens is t uh, people would, or teachers, lecturers would use technology. That's the physical devices, technologies. They would use systems, and they would use a whole lot of resources for their practice. So to go on to practice. Um, I was asking myself, uh, what are our expectations? Because when we look at professional development programs or implementation, um, there seems to be, there seem to have been uh, an, a school of thought that says, uh, we've reached that level. We now uh, passed the basic level. We're now into the innovative level. That something has been achieved and we need to move on to the uh, next. Uh, one of the things that you will find that people will say when it comes to our um, uh, expectations is that uh, the person is very good. The person uses technology all the time. This is very, very innov innovative. And what you would find is happening is that people are actually starting to measure. They are starting to measure as opposed to assess what is happening. The measurement is that they want to say, okay, uh, uh, it has been achieved, you can move on to the next, now you have to complete this course before you go on to the next course. That was very much about a measurement of a particular space in the continuum. But what I am arguing for is that it is not about 
measuring where the person is, but about assessing where the person is in terms of a whole row of things. So these are the statements, and you don't uh, really have to respond to these there, is that how do you feel about the way in which uh, things are actually implemented or expected, that it has been achieved, you must move on to the next, it must be measured, and then you can move on to the next. So with this here, I wanted to use an example, the small example. I've not used this in the paper itself, uh, importantly, but I wanted to use this as an example that came from Dr. Rubin, where he talks of the way in which integration, this is about the practice, the way in which it is done. So quite often they would talk of people substituting, and I've adapted it from a source, where Originally, we would have a handwritten paper where we would have something to, 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 for the students to actually do. Then there was an area of substitution where we started typing this out. And then we went into augmenting this where they would then start using things like text-to-speech functions. And then it is said you go on to modif modifying it and then to redefinition. Now, this is, is quite sound because these are the type of things that do happen when you integrate, when you actually uh, practice it. But what you will find is that it seems to follow this particular order of substitution, augmentation, then modification, and then redefinition. Now, this is, is, is very useful because it is a way in which this, this actually happens. But we need to actually ask ourselves, is this always an order? Is there always an order in which we actually um, uh, go through in our integration? So to do that, I need to ask myself, and and then for you to ask yourself, where do you believe you are in the in that previous model? And I'll just flash it up again. Do you feel that a lot of what you do uh, on the first, second, third, or fourth? Um, parts of the framework, or do you feel that you could be at different parts at the same time? So what you will see then in, in, in a reflecting on this here, the, the question that actually came to, to us is, what are the types of threads? And you will see we've put it out in five threads. You will remember from the use, the continuum of use, we said personal, to administration, to teaching, and then to learning. When we come to practice, we have five different threads, and these threads here are very much about, we use technology for particular things, right? Um, what is then innovative or traditional or non-traditional? At one, at now, if we were to say we're using Mixit, somebody might say, well, that's a very traditional use of ICTs. But at the time when Mixit came up, it was one of the important things that uh, became and was considered to be innovative. So we have you started using different things. We started using chat rooms in the old days. We started using uh, Dropbox. We started uh, with a lot of YouTube. Then we went on to WhatsApp. Then blogs came in. Then MOOCs were in, then Twitter was in, then Facebook. And so if you look, these type of technologies have been changing. What was also happening in terms of our continuum of practice is that we would have started off with presenting, people presenting things to us and then representing. So if we look at the continuum lower down on the slide, uh, we start off with use of technology, and you will find the third one where I talk of innovation becomes the norm. But that we mean is if I decided I'm going to use, let's say, currently, currently uh, Instagram. So if I feel at the moment I'm using it innovatively, it's an innovation. But further down the line, this innovation or using Instagram just becomes part of my normal work, it becomes part of my practice itself. And so I start looking for new uses. So whilst we could be criticized for being traditional, you will find that some things become part of us and are no longer considered innovative. So 
A teacher who used a data projector or a lecturer who used a data projector, wow, this person is using technology in the class. But now it's uh, almost an everyday occurrence to actually see that happening. You will find then, if I look at the second thread, we talk of people using technology and we talk now of people integrating technology. So people don't just use it to present the lessons, but they're making it part of the lessons. The third one is very, very useful because when the critique come about traditional talk and representational work, this is about representing the work. The written assignment that the student used to give us is now represented to us, but this time they simply use a word processor to do it. But the continuum of this practice is when we are not asking them to simply represent and give back to us certain things, but when the work starts become generative, when they start generating work. When I look at the next stream or the uh, next thread that we put on there, is that when we start our practice, we generally start to use on our own. And after using it on our own, we tend to then start to use it with colleagues and we start to use it with learners or with students. And then we find that we become part in our practice, that we become part of those people who start sharing what we do. In this case, in our study, we said why is it in the school? But it's the type of thing that starts happening at university as well. And then in the last thread, what we wanted to share with you is that we had traditional methods or the traditional teaching. And we said that this year, the progress in this particular aspect of practice is that we get to a point of e-learning, e-teaching, and e-pedagogies. Now, again, I have not in this presentation mentioned TPAC, but when we refer to e-pedagogy, we're referring to aspects of TPAC, where it's not just the PCK and the pedagogical content knowledge, but the, an understanding of how technology plays a part in the uh, teaching learning situation whenever we have ICTs. So. Go moving on, I wanted to then share with you what the progress is. Now, an important thing is the, the two as two things that I used over there was the UNESCO documents and the Department of Education documents. Remembering at the time this study was done in 2016 and most of the data was collected in 2015. Now, an important thing, when we look at this, people are saying to us, but um, uh, the teacher, the student has to be at entry level, adoption level, uh, we're paying for this, we have a course for this, that and the other. But this became a bit of a problem. So when I mapped these three, the stages of teaching, that's the first one on the left hand side, the continuum of approaches and the use of ICTs for teaching and learning, also UNESCO, and then the teacher development framework uh, by the Department of Basic Education here in, in South Africa. Uh, when I mapped these across, we found that we were able to bring them on the extreme right hand side down to three basic space uh, stages, uh, a basic stage, an integration stage, and a specialization stage. Now, when we look at this over here, these uh, frameworks, these models, these stages are very, very sound. I mean, where it has been tested many times, it has been used many times, and this so there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But what we did was to try to get a sense of what does all of this mean. So we've kind of mapped them out in such a way to figure out uh, how it was doing. But there are identifiable features in it. And you see there when you talk of entry, emerging, discovery, it tells you that these are somehow at the basic levels. So we are arguing that these are not particular points of achievement. And that is one of the things we put on the key takeaway. And our critique of this is not the what we see on the screen, but the way in which it is implemented, the way in which it is interpreted by schools, by training providers, by NGOs, whoever it is that uses this framework, the way in which they interpret it is that Yes, we've got this, we've got so much of money, everybody is at an implying stage, and so the school is now ready for more money or things of that sort. So we are saying that these are not points of attainment, but rather these are points at which uh, that, that development starts taking place. So when we, when we did the next thing, we took the continuum and we cross-mapped it 
against one another. And this, these are the things that, and uh, the way in which we put it, we put the arrow horizontally saying that we start from basic going to specialization. Also trying to say that we start off small, going much bigger as we move uh, to the other end. And then we also put an arrow coming downwards, that's starting very big, very wide, and saying that what happens is we start from there specializing and going deeper into it. So in the box on the right-hand side, what we've actually uh, been talking about over there, is that our claim is that a teacher, a lecturer, a person is active at different points on the continuum. Second one is that you can be operating at different points on this continuum at the same time, simultaneously. And when you do interact, when you engage at these different points, you do them with different frequencies, sometimes more, sometimes less, and varying intensity. Sometimes you really go into it deeply and sometimes not. Now, what this here is actually referring to, uh, or if I could just explain a little more about it, we're saying that a person could be using a word processor, but the person could also be using um, a word processor, but this person has already included a link to a YouTube video. So this person has basic, but also doing a bit of integration as well. But at the same time, in the basic level, he might just be or she might just be typing things down and not really doing anything more with word at that basic level. But what you would find is at the integration level, this person might be starting to take this YouTube video that they've put in as a link, but then started giving the students some generative tasks to do, in other words, engaging with them using some of the TPEC technologies so that it becomes very, very useful. Another example could be that a person could be using a learning management system, as one of the comments said, that they would simply put the notes up on the learning management system. Now, somebody would say, wow, if they're using an LMS, if they're using Sakai or Blackboard or Moodle, wow, this, this lecturer or this teacher is really doing, you know, innovative work. But all that the teacher could be doing is very basic, simply putting up notes, putting up the quiz and waiting for the system to do it. Whereas another person might be actually incorporating other aspects of uh, social media within that learning management system, which is different. That same person could still be struggling or still be trying to figure out how uh, Excel works and how to do pivot tables in Excel. So what we're saying is a person uh, should not be located and say, well, you're only at basic or you're only at integration, but you could be working at different points depending on your experiences or your needs. And when you get to a particular point of absolute interest to you, then you start going deeper into it. So if somebody is really into figuring out how Facebook is going to be useful, this person then starts working with the Facebook. So I want to then just round up a little bit over here or to go towards the end and, and actually revisit the debate and our key takeaways. Parts of the debate were that we don't use technologies, that we don't use it the way in which it is expected, and the way in which those of us that do use it, that it is traditional, but also that we have been able to achieve certain levels in terms of our use of technologies. With these here, I, I would like to, to say to you that perhaps we are using technologies, but we don't underuse it. We use it when it's actually useful for us, when we feel that it will actually give us some sort of benefit. When we, when we are said, when it is said that we don't use technologies as expected, perhaps uh, there's too much emphasis being placed on uh, when you use uh, LMS, you've got to use everything at the same time. But we need to be conscious of the fact that you don't always have to use a video. You don't always have to use a simulation. You may not want to have a live chat or a synchronous chat or an asynchronous chat for that particular thing. It's about understanding what we want to do with those particular technologies. When they say we use technologies in very traditional ways, 
Um, if we were to consider ourselves, if we take out the, the E out of E learning, the M out of M learning, if we take out the C out of the collaborative learning, we will find that learning is still the same. It is inherently the same. So when we talk about traditional, yes, we want to be able to move from a transmission mode only, but we want to bring in other things, then our, the critique that our use of technologies is traditional only must be seen in terms of a continuum of how people will use it, but there will always be aspects of traditional uh, teaching, learning, or traditional methodologies used in uh, the way in which we use our ICT. But of course, the last one over there said it has been achieved. This becomes quite a difficult one because if we are going to measure people because uh, it's a money thing that uh, we've invested so much, we need to know that people are here or this person or this unit or this department has achieved this status, so now it can move on to the next. That becomes a bit problematic for us in the sense that uh, I'm hope, hoping that I was able to show that there is a continuum that it is not a particular point that say, well, I'm there and I've done that, I'm now going on to the next, but we are moving fluidly backwards and forwards amongst this, uh, on this continuum, but whilst we're moving backwards and forwards, we're also going deeper with some things and we do this at different times. So in terms of these next two bullet points that I've got there is the conscious choices that people make. In other words, that all people that use technology, whether, whether it is a lot, of or a little of it, they only do it because of the benefits that they would get from it. It's influenced by a lot of things, but the value proposition that we get from it is what actually helps us to make decisions on whether we want to. So it's a very conscious choice, conscious decisions from us, whether we want to use it in our personal and professional life. At the same time, you will find there are things that we, uh, uh, aspects that we would do in our personal lives that we wouldn't do, you know, professional life using ICTs and vice versa as well. The second point again is a reiteration that when we use technologies, when we integrate it and our own development in our use and integration of technologies, this is not sequential. It doesn't follow a very stepwise uh, approach to things. And to say that we are at this point, we're in the next point. There is a fluid movement backwards and forward. So when we look at the last two points that I've got over there, the development in progress tends to be, I'm just going to go back one slide, tends to be from basic to specialization to advance. And then in complexity, we would go from basic integration entry and then moving into specialization. That, ladies and gentlemen, is... Uh, a little bit of inputs and sharing that I had in terms of the continuums, uh, specifically in terms of use and how we get to use these things over time. And of course, our additional one in terms of our practice itself on this, this continuum. Uh, the slide over there has uh, Professor Johannes Cronier was my supervisor and also a co-writer of the article which we had published. And there you have my email uh, details as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that was quite um, uh, quite an, uh, an interesting session there. Um, we appreciate very much. I have noted that uh, we um, didn't have any questions so far, but I was just wondering if uh, the same questions that you've taken us through, you've taken uh, when you were doing this this uh, research, if you've taken through some a group of people or some teachers or some some people in higher learning, and how that was taken, what were the responses that you got? Were they almost the same as ours? Perhaps you can share that with us. Okay. The responses, and I'm, uh, <clears throat> the study itself, we worked with uh, school teachers, um, but in the higher education space where I, I do some of my work here at uh, CPUT, we find a similar type of thing, similar in terms of the debate, 
where it is said that things are not used or they're used too traditionally. The next one in terms of looking at what uh, lecturers are using, and now I'm going to talk about lectures because I've spoken about schools, we have a similar type of thing happening. And I would want to say that another study might look very specifically at uh, lecturers in terms of these continuums, but what I have actually found is that teach, uh, lecturers are also beginning to use these on a continuum, some of them going deeper into it and some of them are actually just perhaps starting off and taking it a one step at a time. One of uh, the things that were not mentioned in this particular paper, because it's part of the other study, is what were the reasons that uh, teachers and uh, teachers were, and some lectures are giving for not using it. Now, one of the biggest things is, uh, two of the biggest things are one, they say the technology is not reliable in terms of connectivity and downtime. The second one is they're talking about time. They say there is not enough time to actually do. Uh, this is not part of this study, but what we have started asking questions about now is uh, to what extent is TPEC known to lecturers and teachers, and to what extent do is this actually becoming part of the uh, teacher training, professional development workshops? And what we find that it isn't taking too much, uh, it isn't highlighted much. So there is a tendency for training or sessions to be focused on how to use a technology, which is very much the entry level that we saw in, in the UNESCO and the DOE. In other words, how to use the technology, how to click on this, it's what some people refer to as button training. And then not much is gone going into the pedagogies that can be um, incorporated. Now, one of the things that uh, I've used in a different study with, with uh, schools is to look at Luriad's, uh, Diana Luriad's learning events. In other words, very specifically, that if a learning event requires a student or a learner to respond to you, then you will decide, I'm going to use um, a WhatsApp uh, uh, technology, and I'm going to ask a question, I'm going to wait for an answer. If your intention is only to put out a note or send a message, then you will say, then I will simply upload something. Another example of this in terms of the TPEC that, that doesn't get used often enough is people say, well, I will just use a YouTube video, but there is no interaction. In other words, there aren't points where they say, we timestamp it at this point, now you need to answer a question, or please play the video and stop it at this particular time and I need you to respond. So we have found very similar things in terms of um, uh, schools and in terms of uh, lecturers as well. Uh, there's a question. Um, thank you. Yeah? Yes, please go on, yes. You must be there, yes, please. Okay. There was a question, there is a question that's come up here where gender aspects put into consideration. Uh, we, I looked at the results in terms of gender, but it was not put in there to check whether male or female actually responded differently to it. So the, the sample itself uh, on, in the study itself had both male and female. Um, the spread was high schools and primary schools. They were at independent schools as well as Model C schools, Quintiles 1s, Quintiles 5, so it was a large. I, we additionally had an online survey with um, 76 to 77 respondents. I can't remember the exact number now, but there we had uh, that one we took wider than the Western Cape. And so we had a, a range of uh, male, female, and different uh, uh, school types as well. Um, thank you. I, I thought someone else was typing, but I think they are still composing their question. I have another question, uh, perhaps uh, it's about the, the income or the, the richness or the poorness of, of, of the institutions that you, you, you interviewed. 
did that matter also in, in the responses? Uh, let's say a higher, you know, a school that is considered uh, high class and another one is considered a public school or I don't know how you name them in, in, in South Africa, but in Kenya we have public schools and we also have uh, the, the private schools. Does that matter? Did that matter in the responses? Okay. It did show slight differences in the responses, but uh, the, if I were to pinpoint for you how that made a difference, and I'll just make a distinction, let's say uh, well-off schools and not so well-off schools financially, and then I will say well-managed schools and not so well-managed schools, uh, schools. Now, you will find that even if a school is not well-off financially, you could have very well-managed schools. So in the first instance, when it came to the finances, uh, poor schools and not so poor schools, we found that um, the poorer schools struggled with access to technology. And because they struggled with access to technology, they were less likely to want to use all of the, or they were less likely to use all of the things that they had. And that was the only difference a main difference, I would say, in terms of the finances. But when I talk about well-managed and not so well-managed schools, this was, I mean, it didn't matter whether they were higher quintile or lower quintile. Where if you found a principal or a school management, and I'm thinking here in terms of faculties in university, where the head or the people in management are very much into the possibilities of using technology, this then started to filter down into the school itself. But there were two ways in which it's done, and this we found in the school. Some management, some schools insisted that you have to use it, and they started measuring how many times did you use it, how many lessons did you use, how many hours were you using it for, what subjects were you using it for. And in some cases, teachers simply did it because they were forced to do it. But the off, uh, spin off of that was, wasn't a bad thing, because what you found is that teachers started using it. Where you found that management at the school was not behind schools using it, then you found that the teachers would say, ah, well, I don't really need to use it as well. So those were the type of differences we got between the well-off and not so well-off. But I think an important thing, and this links to the current study uh, that you mentioned that I was busy with, with the assessment for learning in Africa, you will find if the principles of using ICTs or of using assessment for learning are sound and that the professional development, the approaches, the implementation, the interventions are based on very sound principles. It doesn't matter whether it is a rich school or a small school uh, or, or, or a poor school because then it's about what you can actually get out of it that seems to win the day. Uh, I'm sure you can see the, the question yes, from uh, yes. 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 Very interesting one. How was the issue of policy addressed and resolved in the schools uh, survey? Uh, what is the level of technology possession amongst the students surveyed? Now, there were two aspects in terms of the schools that were actually used. First one, I'm going to start with the second question first, the level of technology possession. In the schools that we work, all of the schools had at least one computer lab. That means they had the access to it. Some of the schools, the students already had, uh, let's say, access to a tablet. It may have, uh, you know, it was the kind of thing that gets handed out in schools and then, you know, taken back at the end of the day. So they did, did have access to technology. Uh, this, And then now linking onto the second one of the issue of policy, here at the school. Some schools have a policy that you may not use your mobile phone. And so even though that some of the students had technology to use at the particular school, they were not allowed to use it. So in terms of policies, and this now starts linking to the second question again, in terms of policies at schools, um, policies tend to be tended to be very, very bureaucratic. In other words, it was 
they say that look we have uh, supplied the technology to schools we have bought these resources we have these accesses so we now need teachers to actually use it so they would say every teacher is to use it at least uh, four times a day every teacher is to use it in his or her subject the learners are to do at least two um, uh, submission of uh, work via word process processing in schools where they use things like Edmodo uh, some of them use Google Docs they said that this teacher must ensure that so policies are are generally built around the what must be done with the technology and what must happen there were a few schools in this particular sample that we found where they had a professional development a program uh, set out again our criticism uh, like we said or our critique of it is that they were saying that okay teachers must go for this advanced course and this basic course and this innovation course they must do this and that and the other but very importantly I think it was useful to see that there was a sort of a policy that every teacher in the school to be able to use ICTs in teaching and learning needed to go through some sort of professional development and what was really good to see was that the schools themselves would organize it among themselves using their own people as well as NGOs that would come in as well as universities that would come in and all of this started supplementing what the Department of Education was actually uh, doing in in the in the training space uh, there's another question the purposefully selected uh, technique is not a problem yes the purposefulness of the selection over here was not the technology the unit of analysis in this particular one was the teacher and so I used a snowball sampling after an initial selection with where I look for teachers who were using technology in fact at the beginning of the thesis itself I put a disclaimer or rather uh, said very clearly up front that I was not looking for teachers I was not looking to find out why teachers were not using technology so my first thing was to find any of those teachers who were using technology for whatever and that was great because I found teachers if one if one might want to say okay we're on the continuum I found teachers using things at a very basic level very innovative level and people in between so the sample was uh, teachers who were using technology that was the important thing and in some cases yep they had technology some of them had lots of technology some some of them had yes Yes, the snow, snowball sampling was one example to use that. At the time of doing the study, I, I had been working with the, I was still employed with the education department and with the ethics, I, I was able to get a list of teachers who had undergrown some sort of ICT training by the department. So I approached a few of these teachers through the different district uh, officials where they said this is a lead teacher for us and we asked that lead teacher to suggest people that they knew in the particular district so from the different districts in the Western Cape uh, we then started looking okay here's somebody who's using technology and we went to speak to them and that would be with the last question that was the Yes, that was the last um, question, unless someone else has a banning one. I think uh, we are just uh, about uh, a minute to time, or even less, depending on your, on your hour. Uh, I wish to thank you, but uh, do you have something to say before we close, please, uh, Dr. Osman? Yes, one of the things that I would like to encourage all of us in this chat room, and I, you see, I still use the old terminology, the chat room, <laughs> um, is to encourage anybody else that's uh, interested or working in this particular uh, space over here, is to look at this aspect of uh, professional development and how we can work at programs that allow people to be fluidly moving uh, in continuums. Uh, a second thing that would be really very useful is a similar type of study specifically at lecturers uh, at university perhaps if the different universities uh, start looking at this then perhaps we might get a 
a better picture of what's happening in terms of uh, university lecturers and continuing. Uh, and also acknowledging that we have people from other parts of Africa uh, with this type of thing, uh, with these continuums ring true in their context. Uh, and if so, you know, it would be good to collaborate with uh, uh, Professor Cronier and myself perhaps and, and others on uh, looking to taking the study a little further. Uh, the question is that the slides, I believe the slides are going to be are available as well as a copy of the article uh, and uh, it, I believe that it has been recorded but perhaps Irene can uh, respond to the last two questions over there. Yes, uh, the recording will be shared in very many formats because we were even doing it live. Um, and we will have a recording of this, uh, which will send a link for you, and it is really very, very easy to retrieve. Uh, we shall also share, of course, the, the presentation will come with a recording uh, from the Adobe Connect that we have. And we can also share that, yes, um, it's already shared, actually, uh, Nicholas helps that. With that. Um, so as we come to the end of this session, uh, we wish to thank you more sincerely uh, for, for everything. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming to present to us and, and thank you for taking time. And all those who were present today, uh, those who could not stay, we came only for a few, uh, a, a few minutes because that's what they could afford. We thank you too. And I hope you come back, Dr. Osman Sadek. I hope you come back for another session. We'll appreciate you. So this, uh, we shall call it a day. And thank you again for coming. Uh, I think we say bye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, yes, I would I would love to be on, on uh, Image Africa again sometime. Thank you all and bye-bye. Bye, everyone, and uh, have a good afternoon.